started. All right. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Governance Committee meeting. I'm going to start today with a roll call. Roll call. Um, Councillor Lombardi? Here. Councillor Tabor? Here. And I'm Councillor Cook, and I am present. Um, the next item on the agenda is approval of minutes from our meeting on May 31st, 2022. Um, did anyone, did everyone have an opportunity to look at the draft minutes? Yeah. Um, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, any questions or comments on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the minutes are approved. Uh, Currently, the Governance Committee is discussing uh, committees and ordinances um, to sunset. And so we have a list of those committees. Um, I'm going to pull up the list of committees um, for us first, and um, then we have a guest speaker today who I'm going to invite to speak. Let me share my screen for everyone so you can see, um, see exactly, uh, just a second, it's not cooperating. Um, uh, Max. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love this discussion. It's hilarious. Um, so let's see if I can share my screen. It's gone away. Zoom. I am still up there. You are still up there, yes. All right, where's my Zoom link? There I am. Okay. Share screen. There we go. So these are the committees that we're discussing. This is the list. I usually can zoom in a little and so everyone has a little bit better visual. Um, the first committee that we're going to start with is the Portsmouth Heritage Museum Board uh, for which we had questions at our last session around um, necessity. Um, of the Portsmouth Heritage Museum Board specifically on record retention and archiving. And so we've invited Christine Fries, our library director, um, to come in and speak with us today. So um, I will turn it over to her and ask her if, if she can help us, if she knows anything about this Portsmouth Heritage Museum Board and if um, otherwise about archives and library storage. For okay, research. the board itself, I do not have background on, I will say that. However, um, right before the pandemic hit, uh, City Hall and the library had an ongoing discussion about what to do about various types of records. And um, it became clear that we have different interests in the records, but we all are interested in the records. Um, and so a group of people from City Hall from different departments here, including finance and legal, um, along with our archivists, the people in charge of the library's special collections, got together and talked about, well, what are the criteria for things? So there are the legal requirements by the state or by the city. Um, or maybe the federal even. And then there is what we think will actually be valuable to um, to the city years from now, even if it's not required that we keep it. And among those things are the things that our special collections know are in big demand from people studying Portsmouth and seacoast history and genealogy. So there are items that perhaps we don't have to keep for 200 years, but people go back and look at tax records and look at wills and look at you know other items uh, from history, the history of houses, um, various interactions with houses, um, maybe building, you know, when things were added on. People come and look for their, the history of their house in Portsmouth all the time uh, when people buy a house particularly, but sometimes when they're gonna renovate, they'll look for that. And what we discovered in those um, discussions is that we have a pretty vibrant partnership with several places in the city, including Discover Portsmouth and the Athenaeum, along with the library and city hall. And it was, um, it was fairly clear, although we hadn't identified storage issues or some of the more detailed nuances of archiving, that we did have a good bit of expertise between us 
in terms of what the legal and financial ramifications were and in terms of how best to archive things and how to protect them over the years and then where they could be. I think one of our issues we looked at was duplication because we don't want to duplicate efforts. And if City Hall has copies and the library has copies and the Athenaeum has copies, that's a lot of things. As we know, it just keeps growing. So the size, the, the storage issues were big, but we seem to have a good collection of expertise. So I'm not sure what the board adds to that collection of, of expertise and of interests. I think the, that interest of what we should keep is pretty broad as well. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I brought it up at the last meeting, and that is that um, Ellen is on the uh, is a proprietor of the Athenaeum mm -hmm. and um, and is on the board of the Historical Society. So both those organizations are dealing with um, storage of valuable records. Oh yes. And uh, it just strikes me that um, all these records are connected. They are. And so. Uh, I, I just wonder if there's a potential of having a Portsmouth s controlled storage facility um, that is larger than just the library, um, mm -hmm. but that it you know can be a service to the community as well, and um, you know participate in. The, the storage of all these valuable records. So that, that's, that was my question. I, I can't speak for City Hall and the other players, but I know that both the Athenaeum and the library are feeling squeezed for space. Mm -hmm. And this came up, and as you'll have noticed during the budget process, you know, the big issue here is where and who pays for it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have the space. The Athenaeum clearly does not have the space for what they've got. Um, and if Discover Portsmouth has space, well, we know it wasn't it wasn't enough space for the library, so I'm I, I'm not sure. As and it keeps well, growing, so we don't throw away the 200-year-old documents. We don't now. Some of those could be digitized, but a lot of them are rare, potentially important documents that we need to keep in perpetuity. And I don't. I was not in on those initial um, conversations. Our previous director was involved in that. We have that history between him and our head of reference. We can certainly ask them questions, but I know that the feeling was that that would be great, but how? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask a question, too, about this? Um, I, I think Council Lombardi's idea is a really great idea. It would be a wonderful contribution to everybody in the city Agreed. If that could happen, if somebody could do it. Um, but, and clearly the city could do it if it... Uh, so know, chose. So chose, yeah. And that's why I, I want to ask these next few questions. Would To do something like he has suggested, would you, would you have to have a specialized facility, you know, fireproof walls or those, you know, those shelves that, you know, they roll back and forth on wheels and all that stuff, or... For some of it, you would. Um, in our special collections, we have temperature and humidity control. We have a special alarm. If the temperature goes above something, I get notified, and the and the heating people get notified. So, so keeping you humidity. You need a place, and then you have to put all that stuff in. Correct. The place. And I'm not Natural. I'm not an archivist, so I can't tell you which pieces. Mm -hmm. I know there are things that are not in our vault, um, and I don't know if that's because there's no room or because they don't really need the same humidity and temperature, but I do know that we have quite a bit. The maps, a lot of paper needs that humidity and it needs the cool temperature. So yes, to answer your question. So if the city wanted to do something like that, the city would have to find a place, the city would have to buy that stuff that you just talked about, put it in that place, and then find some way to, to uh, staff it with people to, you know, Kind of becomes kind of a big deal, I guess. It is. It is. And I think that's what they came to two years ago, is yeah. this is a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen that function uh, taken under the wing of, of state universities mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. some places. For local collections? Well, they have 
you know, a state history archive mm -hmm. at a, un a state university and then towns and cities and, and even private donors mm -hmm. all donate their records. We don't have a university in Portsmouth, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, you know, in this city, the interest in that kind of stuff is, I think, far greater than most cities. Yes. It is. People really care about those things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if you had a repository for all that stuff, people would use it. And those and those partnerships I mentioned, I think, are different from anywhere I've worked. The ability to work effectively with the Historical Society and with the Athenaeum, who have the same interests and some of the same expertise, um, is, and, is really huge. And records. As and records, yeah, all of the content. Yeah. Um, so I have a question around uh, our committee structure. What makes sense for um, for us to be considering as far as uh, to address an issue like this? Mm -hmm. Should we still have a Portsmouth Heritage Museum board, or should we um, be considering kind of a committee that is run from the library standpoint because you guys have the expertise? Mm -hmm. To, to do that and already making those connections in the community. I just, I would like to have your opinion on that because um, I believe this board was initially established to create those discussions. Okay. And those discussions started happening and then we ended up with Discover Portsmouth. And um, so a lot has happened since this was initially envisioned. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know organically where, where should that be um, housed? Uh I'm not sure what your options are in terms of board construction, mm -hmm. but I do think that among our entities, City Hall, Library, and then the two outside entities, um, there's a lot of know-how in there. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm, I'm not sure how much else there is in the community, but I think that those people have had this, have started this discussion and do know the content we're talking about and do know the options. Um, now. You know, it would be helpful to be communicating what they're finding with the board, with the council. I mean, because um, as we say, if there's gonna, if we're gonna go forward, it's gonna be a matter of property and budget and other things that affect you. Right. That makes sense. Does it um, does it make sense uh, in some ways to maybe shift this to a committee structure um, for things like grants? Would it help to have have it? kind of a committee under the city to apply for grants. I know that that helped with their cemetery committee. I think, I think that's for Bob, but I would guess so because the city could be the fiscal agent. I would think the city's probably eligible for more grants than almost anybody else, so that makes sense to me. Okay. And am I correct, we could ask, for, we could act as fiscal agent if someone else got a grant as well, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I would also just Probably the Strawberry Bank too. Oh yes. You know, and it's um, uh, I'm sure they. I mean, they have a lot of space, but not storage. Specialized space. space. Yes. Yes. Agreed. And I'd also add, throw in that um, you need special fire suppression Correct. systems as well, oh. right. which is Dry not sprinklers as opposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yes. The current committee. Does it have citizens on it, or is it all? I'm sorry, the board, or? Yeah, the, what was the Heritage Museum Board? Uh, that, I, that I do not know. Here, let me look up the ordinance again. Um, second. These, uh, unfortunately, the ordinances are not in alphabetical yeah. order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, chronological. Uh, so here, um, the current membership, the membership as established was five members, uh, mayor, city manager, um, director of the library, two citizens of Portsmouth, um, one appointed by the mayor and one person shall be appointed by the trustees of Prescott Park. So uh -oh. I think that this was, I mean, this was before we had yeah. kind of a sense of, um, of the organizations in town that were doing this kind of work. I mean, clearly, the you know trustees of Prescott. I mean, a lot of this is just it's just really outdated at this point. Um, so this would probably be uh, need a whole revamp. Um, 
to, to keep this ordinance in place at this stage. And maybe it just should be rethought and renamed too. And um, so it represented, represents more of what we're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. um, Why would there be the would, Prescott Park trustees? Is it something to do with the Prescott? Yeah, you know, their the role trust probably has to do with the trust. trust. Their role has changed over the years. And, right. and, and, you know, they used to administer Prescott Park. Yeah, and actually, sure. The whole park and, they don't anymore. and this was a, just deal with trust. It was established in 1988. Yeah. So I imagine there was a lot around Strawberry Bank, too, mm. right. and thinking around Strawberry Bank yeah. when it came to museum heritage. Yeah. Um, so. But it doesn't make any sense anymore. It didn't. Yeah, maybe it didn't make sense then. Yeah. Do you have <laughs> the option to simply sunset that and create a different yes. mm -hmm. task yes. force or board? I'm not sure within ordinance is what you, what all your options are, but right, we, well, we can create through ordinance or through a um, city council special committee. Um, mm -hmm. Either of those would probably work. Um, Right. If it's a longer term thing, I would think that we would want to do an ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, if it's if it's a project, maybe a special committee. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the challenge. Do we do we modify the current um, ordinance um, because it's probably you know, or just scrap it and write a new ordinance to establish a permanent committee, or do we set up a blue ribbon committee? which is a lot easier to do, mm -hmm. um, just set up a blue ribbon committee and then have them, the committee itself decide whether or not it needs to be a permanent committee um, and decide the, the makeup of that. Make, we can make recommendations on a blue ribbon committee, mm -hmm. whereas an ordinance, it's, it's very set. Right. Um, so, so uh, you know, I think that it would be nice to know from, from your perspective, what would be most useful because I think that the library's really kind of been the lead in these discussions and so we want to make sure that we are kind of addressing this from your perspective what would be most effective okay yeah. thank you um, I think given what it was set out what it set out to do that kind of scrapping and starting over makes sense to me and what makes more sense to me is a committee or task force to kind of say what are the parameters of this to determine what's going to be needed as an ordinance later okay. because I can see if especially if we are able to build a location and, ha and need budget for that location I can see that needing to be an ongoing committee or board mm -hmm. but I think initially just to figure out what that that is mm -hmm. might be more flexible to have the blue ribbon committee or a task force or okay. yeah thank you thank you does does anyone have other questions? Would you have more? I thought you had. I thought you had more. Uh, the uh, no, I guess I've probably gone as far as uh, I I can at the moment. But I really like that. I'm sitting there kind of captivated with the idea of a you know a dedicated historical document location. Mm -hmm. Fort Knox for. Uh... There you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know that there's the National Archive. Well, of course. Uh, there are state archives. Uh, why couldn't we have a city archive? I'm intrigued with that. I, I also uh, think it could be public money or it could be some philanthropist that says, I want to have well, create an archive. That would create some yeah. lawns or some. <laughs> yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, Ongoing foundation. Uh, well, uh, you know, to stand it up, obviously, you need a place and you need the temperature control and the, the staffing, art. fire suppression. Staffing, you need to staff it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fire suppression. Mm -hmm. I will say that among the, uh, the staffing is the kind of last thing I would look at because so many of these things, once indexed and potentially digitized, could be accessible online unless the actual document needed it needed to be touched so I would think in the list of where I would go with this it would it would be more the space and the protection mm -hmm. and the um, protecting the items that are coming in like the ones that that we found in the beginning of this discussion you know how do we keep them safe 
but once they're there, I think it's it's not like staffing a branch library, um, which is a lot of staff. And I think it would be very helpful to have these discussions across these organizations because there there is a lot of shared resource Correct. already. Um, and it would be nice to have a resource that is a public-private partnership with these nonprofit organizations. Agreed. Um, just for the sense that they hold a lot of our heritage that the city doesn't hold. Indeed. And a lot of the city's documents are sitting in basements in file cabinets. It would be helpful to get them out as well. So mm -hmm. to have that, that shared arrangement I think would be quite nice. I agree. And these are existing partnerships. I mean these are people that we've we've had partnerships with for a long time. So it's um, easy enough to do. Yeah. You Wonderful. know it's funny what historians find interesting too. Yeah. Things that you wouldn't it wouldn't occur to you are worth keeping or like you know, water bills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Historians would read look at water bills of properties in the city and, and they'd make great findings from that. Whereas, you know, the average person throws them off. Right. Uh, and who would have thought 100 years ago, That's I think that's one of the issues that archivists look at is, you know, based on what we know people are looking for when they're doing their genealogy or the history of the town, mm -hmm. what are we creating now that needs to be protected because it's not going to just stop? It's, it's everything, where, as you say, the water bills, it's going to be meeting minutes and, and recordings of your meetings that someone in 50 years is going to say, wow, look at right. look what that board decided. Right. And and we have to be thinking, too, about um, long-term storage for those things. Correct. Aside from the cloud or, yeah. you know, it, how do you store electronic data in yeah. the long run to preserve it? Or is electronic data even the way to do it? You know, the pro I went to some seminar or something once. I remember somebody saying, if you really want to keep a record forever that people will always be able to read, keep it on high quality paper. Yeah. And this is what the archivists tell me. Yeah. yeah, they do. But there are things, whether it's for preservation or for access, as you know, we have a lot of digitized collections at the library and we just keep doing that because there are people around the country who want to access it and not come here. So it you could be both. For the access. Right. You have the, have the archive for the, right. for the paper. But then we have things like climate change and water. Yeah. Yeah. in this area that we have to look at in terms of where do you put it it's um is it on site is it off site is it mm -hmm. yes. so. that's the thing i'm concerned about i'm concerned about records being stored in a basement setting and having water issues right. um in the long run um and we need to be well above the high water mark for storage <laughs> so Whatever that is. Yeah. <laughs> it's changing. <laughs> it's a nice hill in Newmarket. <laughs> so, um, so thank you. Does anyone have any other questions before? Um, I, I would say um, I, I thought of the organizations that I know of. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are other organizations that, Correct. you know, maybe, you know, Maybe the uh, Masons, maybe you know places like that, you know, or individuals, or individuals. You know, what has Sherm Pridham got in his, yeah, office? <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> and you know, these people go to their call to glory. You know, yeah. they'll probably want to donate it to the Athenaeum or the library or right. somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they were constantly yeah. accumulating. This this can become a major issue. Um, you know, I. At one point, when I lived in Exeter, was on the Exeter Historical Society board, and we did not have space to store people's collections, and people would donate a collection to you. And if it didn't come with um, additional funds mm -hmm. for storage and maintenance, um, you, you couldn't take the donation. Right. And so it would end up some of those donations that were left in wills when people didn't weren't thinking about whether or not um, the Historical Society could take it. Those donations would then go to the state. Um, instead of going to Exeter, which the intention was to go to Exeter, but right. but if a donation would come in without funding for maintenance um, and no storage possibilities, they could accept it. You know, so so that's a challenge as well. Having clear guidelines around um, donations, which they did have, but not everybody pays attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, and having a facility and um, and having kind of that information widely available 
is helpful as well. And I so think that's why things. eventually having that permanent board is important because as you're doing right now mm -hmm. and as we do at the library, you constantly reassess your policies mm -hmm. and you assess the technologies. What are the changes that we went from microfilm to microfiche to the cloud? You know, what what is the next technology that we're going to have to migrate to? And also, what are the policies around donations? And mm -hmm. it'll be different in 10 years. So, oh, so thank you. I hope that helps. Yeah, I guess I, I would ask, I mean, we went, you know, 100% to documents and um, archives, but I don't know if there are other things that this Portsmouth Heritage Museum Board cared for. Uh, cared mm -hmm. for, and I'm, I'm just wondering if there are other things Realia. from the library that... We have realia collections. They're the ones that we um, have digitized and we're still digitizing. Again, donated from a hundred and some years ago mm -hmm. um, and delicate. And those are, those are on our digital collections. Um, I don't know what this board cared for besides papers. Um, yeah, I don't know either. I, mean, uh, I guess I'm wondering if, if the, it was beyond archiving, if, right. if their interest was beyond archiving. Um, and from my reading of the ordinance, it's basically they they wanted to make sure that there was growth and improvement of the Portsmouth Heritage Museum, subject to approval of the city council. You know, it was it was about mm -hmm. having a strong Portsmouth Heritage Museum, which mm -hmm. I think is um, it can it would be it would be very challenging since we don't have a Portsmouth Heritage Museum mm -hmm. at this point to leave this as is <laughs> um, and I don't know that the city is in the business anymore of supporting any of the museums directly in that sense besides yeah, no, I, working in cooperation aside um, from the public private partnership for the Discover Center mm -hmm. well, we like by the way the Discover system. Center has officially changed their name to the Portsmouth Historical Society oh, oh yeah, yeah. I wonder if they change it on the lease. <laughs> uh oh. It's <laughs> a different committee, Bob. <laughs> that's, that's the legal part. Let's leave that one. <laughs> Let's leave that out. <laughs> DBA. DBA. <laughs> Do Mrs. S, yes. Uh, yeah, so, so that is. That's the challenge around this ordinance, I think. It's, yeah. it's just envision something that doesn't exist at this point, so. So. Yeah. Um, any any other questions before? Well, I, th I think it brings us back to we have a committee that envisioned a heritage museum. Heritage museum never happened, but we have this intriguing possibility of of archiving the city's history somewhere. So, you know, it would seem that. The, the old Heritage Museum committee could phase out and quietly die, but it would seem we'd want to maybe some kind of project oriented or task force oriented mayor's blue ribbon committee, maybe mm -hmm. uh, to explore some kind of archive. It'd be n nice to hear from the historical society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think well. I obviously, in the Athenaeum, and you know, one of the things you might run into, of course, is um, what would you call it? Uh, I mean, just there are people who are. I'm, I'm lost for the word, but you know, the priorities pri are priorities different. Priorities, and well, and also, you know. This is our collection. Mm -hmm. right. Defensive list about yeah. right. turf. Turf. And this is kind of where you, I was thinking when you were talking about the state, you know, a university. This is I've seen this happen in other places where each town is saying no, but that's our town. But I think the partnership that we're talking about, if you if you identified a committee, a task force blue ribbon committee, and gave it a task of bringing back recommendations, I think having those discussions with all those entities and saying yeah how much can you let go of and how much can you not mm -hmm. 
if we had, you know, if that maybe they'll come up and I'm just brainstorming. If we had a place, would you have a shared space, but a section that is owned by the Athenaeum, mm -hmm. not owned, but rented, lease um, by the Athenaeum and controlled by it's them? By, correct. Yeah. I think there are ways to do it simply because the people that I know involved in this are are so worried about protecting these pieces that I think that there would be a lot of give in terms of how how we share, not that they would hand everything over to the city, right. but that we would be able to partner effectively. Yeah, I, I thought of it as a partnership mm -hmm. rather than the city taking it all. Correct, yeah. yeah. And I would see the library as the, the organization within the city that has the expertise to maintain kind of those those archives um, and, and kind of be the point. In terms of archival expertise, I agree. I think the city has a lot of the um, expertise around what has to be kept, what's vital to the city, city documents at least, not library documents, but city documents. The other thing is I think eventually having a city committee that sits with the city as opposed to a public-private simply in the long term when those private entities will shift they'll change their name mm -hmm. the city government i suspect is going to be here for a while so i think that that's the stabilizing center around which you know if two of those other entities merged or one went away god forbid they just changed what their focus is mm -hmm. we would still be here right so that's my last thought thank you Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. You know where to find me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Nice. Thank nice you for joining you us today. I Pleasure. really appreciate it. Have a good day. Yeah, bye-bye. Do you um, want this open? I noticed there was no one. Either, yeah, that would be. Thank you. Um, so um, with that said, I'll share my screen again. Um, and so Portsmouth Heritage Museum Board. Um, if we all agree, um, I will alter this one. I'll make it yellow like the others as mm -hmm. a defunct. But I, I'll put a note here instead of defunct to change this to say um, uh, sunset with um, new committee. Um, does that, is that what? Yeah, a new committee to study historical archive. Okay. okay. New committee to study historical archive. Okay. Does that seem like a reasonable? I think we're all enthusiastic about Councillor Lombardi's idea. Yes, I do. I think it's a, a wonderful idea, and you know, and it it was really. Um, hammered home to me when I was at the Athenaeum for an exhibit last week and they said oh we're just really worried about this documentation and not having a place to go and mm -hmm. so I thought oh you know this is this is a real problem that we're oh it's having. been the burning issue for the organization um, is the, the sheer volume and weight of their exhibits and the building they're in what are they going to do mm -hmm. um, as they run out of space? Mm -hmm. What did you call it? New committee? Um, we s called Sunset with oh. New Committee to Study Historical Ar Archive. So this is the first one that I'd come back to us with uh, that we've come back with a recommendation for something new. Um, if we go back to the top of the list, um, we had several that we had decided were defunct. Board of Health, Board of Plumbing Examiners, uh, Building Commission, Microenterprise Advisory Committee. Yeah, and we and, had input from staff on all of those. Yes, exactly. Um, the Pierce Island Committee, um, I'm gonna stop share and show you the minutes from yeah. the last meeting so that everybody is aware of where we are um, with 
with they're that. Let's we'll see if I can. Quietly bumping themselves off, right? Yes. Yeah, but you know There's what? Going on I have. You know, that's unusual. I I got calls from some committee members, yeah. and they're not happy about that. Okay, yeah. so this is a discussion we're going to have to have with Pierce Island. This is the extent of the last committee meeting minutes update on final projects and disbanding the past committee. Past meeting minutes are about equal in terms okay. of you know, detail. I will share this with you. It's been a committee over the years where seemingly irrelevant issues have all been very important personalities, uh, turf wars, that kind of stuff. And that's actually probably a pretty good committee that serves a pretty good purpose. Um, you know, a lot happens up here, so I know it's important. So when I saw that vote, I thought, this is, this is one of those old ghosts and goblins coming back uh, mm. some way or another. Um, it's interesting because I think that there's probably a discussion worth having around the Pierce Island Committee. Um, because it's a committee for a park space in the city or one space that the city has and i think that um in our next round of discussions when we talk about what we need as far as committees um i think that there are a few of these that we have to discuss in relation to that um, between the master plan committee for prescott park and pierce island and uh trees and greenery as well um which is related but not the same as parks um, but I think it's it's worth having a discussion around purpose mm -hmm. for Pierce Island Committee, I think, at this point. Um, do we, um, I'm happy to go back and check with um, the leadership there to try to find out and attend their next meeting if they have another they're meeting? Not, they're not having another meeting. They've, they've sunsetted themselves. Okay. Uh, All right. Someone's wrong. And so what I some of them. I forget who the two staff members from Public Works are on that committee. Is it Corin? Um, but it would be probably useful to have a conversation with them. I can tell you who they are. Yeah, that would probably be I've more got that useful list. than talking to anybody on the um, committee. <laughs> actually, Get a straight answer. interestingly enough, they the They're listing not does right. not list the staff members yeah. for the committee. Yeah, th this, th this was a real club. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, um, you know, we could also just allow them to sunset if we felt that yeah. that made sense. We're established by ordinance. So yes. Make well, right, sunset. we'd have to remove the ordinance, but we can allow them to sunset if that is the that is the well, desire of the said, committee. There are people who were just new to that committee who really wanted to be on it and wanted to do something with it. And, it, and it, they came up with a lot of resistance from the old guard yeah. who just, they said, you know, yeah. well, we've done our job. Yeah. What? What's the ordinance say its program of work is? Um, the powers, um, hmm. The powers and duties are the committee shall provide advice and recommendations to the city manager and the city council with respect to all issues affecting the development and use of Pierce Island, including the solicitation and acceptance of grants, the expenditure of any funds for specific improvements, and any expenditures from the Pierce Island Trust Fund. Nothing herein shall limit the power of the city council or city manager to take immediate action in the event of exigent circumstances. And then it shall be the responsibility of the Pierce Island Committee to encourage the use and enhancement of Pierce Island in the manner which maximizes the value and use of the island for the residents of the city of Portsmouth while minimizing the impact on the environmental condition and natural beauty of the island. So it's interesting, if it does sunset and there is trust fund, then that would go to the trustees of the trust fund to administer. So that doesn't, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, that's the default. Um, but uh, the purpose of the Pierce Island Committee is not very different than the purpose of any committee that's overseeing other parks or areas, recreation areas in the city. 
as well. So, so the, I think there's a bigger question here around what's the purpose of having a committee just for one mm -hmm. space that is part of the city um, versus um, kind of an overarching committee that looks at this this park space and other park space within the city. Do you happen to know how much the Fort Pierce Island Trust Fund is, what the corpus of that is? Uh, I don't, but I can find out really quickly. Okay. Matter of fact, if you want, I'll go to the leave. I'll grab that. Well, okay. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, you know, Pierce Island is a kind of a unique place. And I mean, when I moved here, um, it was a mess of a place. I mean, it was mm -hmm. it was a real problem. Yeah, there was a murder out there. There was a murder. There was drugs. There, I mean, it was you know, there was uh, rapes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was bad news. Um, and so, I think it, I think this committee was set up specifically to address some of that. Do we have the date that it was? Um, it's not here in I think. the ordinance. Um, it was amended in 99, mm -hmm. um, the duties were, so. Yeah, I kind of remember around 88. I suspect you're right. It was around the time of the murders. Chaos out there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the... Um, I think having kind of an overall parks committee is a big task. Mm -hmm. it is. Um, I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. big task. It is. Uh, and I'm just, I wonder if it's too big to assign to a, a committee. Unless it's, a, unless it's really becomes something more like a commission. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I think I would envision it that way, like the recreation board. Mm -hmm. You know, the recreation board oversees recreation throughout the city. It's a yeah. huge task. Um, it's at several sites, um, you know, several facilities that we maintain. Right. And the right. recreation board oversees that. I, I think I would envision a parks committee as um, overseeing all the parks space within the city um, and working in cooperation with the recreation board where there is rec where there are recreation facilities at parks um, and I think that one of the one of the great disadvantages of having individual park committees is that certain parks get more attention oh, yeah. than other parks like um, Prescott Park and Pierce Island right or as Goodwin Park has no one yeah. overseeing it um, and it's a very prominent park space um, mm -hmm. right in the middle of the Beautiful city park. right and our we're fortunate because our Department of Public Works does a great job of maintaining this these spaces but there isn't a, an overarching committee that says you know we need to develop more playground space on this side of the city mm -hmm. right for example so maybe we should be looking at a playground in one of these park spaces that we have as a city. Or um, we need more green space on this part of, in this part of the city. Is there any land um, that the city owns in this part that could be dedicated to park space that we're not thinking about? Um, so you're thinking about a parks and recreation. Well, parks, and leaving rec board as it is, letting the well, rec board manage the recreation, but maybe they would communicate well with each other and there would be some crossover between the two committees. You would have to, uh, you either have to assume that or make it so. Right, create some cooperation. Well, the, the other lost opportunity is we have a lot of parks, but what's the programming in them? Mm -hmm. Prescott Park, obviously, you know, from the very start, 40 years has had the arts festival, but it's got other programming. It's got yoga, it's got the gardens, it's got mm -hmm. um, all kinds of things that happen there. Pierce Island, you know, has the pool, it has the dog walks, it has the 
volleyball. It has, in other words, those are parks and that is, have is people. Is Fortree Island included in Pierce Island? You yeah, know? sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Okay. so, you know, there's no facilities or programming in the other parks that I know of. No. Um, and could be. They're playgrounds. Right. They're just playgrounds. Well, and we have like the South Mill Pond um, recreation area, essentially, that, but it's a tennis courts and mm -hmm. um, shared with the schools and a mm -hmm. uh, field. But there's also a dog park there. Yeah. Right. And the only recourse for residents, if they have a, an issue there, is to go directly to DPW rather than coming to talk to a committee and saying, you know, I'm having some challenges around the dog park, specifically at South Mill Pond. Um, having an overarching parks committee would provide residents um, an opportunity to offer suggestions around that space, but also the lovely park that is just um, going um, east uh, from the dog park up the hill in front mm -hmm. of City Hall that no one ever talks about, right? We don't talk yeah. about that or, park space. And I don't even know if there's a name for that park. Is there a name for that park? I, I missed that first We're one. Talking. Which one is it? The, the, the park right across, across from City Hall. Right across right. Or the tennis courts. Uh, tennis courts. It goes between oh, yeah. Yeah, South uh, and South uh, Lincoln. Lincoln. So, let's get the word South in it. Okay, so there's a lovely park there. There is Haven Park as well. Mm -hmm. There's Goodwin Park. Um, I don't know the name. There's a lovely park space at Maple Haven. Yeah. The end of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There's you do, yeah. there. There's a small park space um, over off Bartlett. You know, so we have lots of park spaces yeah. in the city. There's even more than that too, for sure. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. There's South Mill Playground. So there are just park spaces throughout well, the city. Well, you've also got some of the biggest green space in the city is Jones Avenue and the new land around the the turf That's playing right. field. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. All right. That land. And the trails all through there. Right. Oh, yeah. And currently and there's gonna be a new park space technically at the skateboard park. Right. right. Um, so what happens I I fear is when you only have a recreation board um, and you don't have a parks committee no one's talking about other opportunities for those green spaces. Um, there are a lot of people in the city would, that would like to have more green space and less recreation, whereas others want more recreation and less green space. So then it's helpful to have... Community campus. Right, there's community yeah. campus. So there's a lot of space that um, I think we're not talking about from kind of that, that bigger picture level beyond capital improvement projects and maintenance that's being done by the city. Um, and, and the capital improvement projects are completely, at this point, not driven by a committee right. or committee discussions. They're driven just by needs um, coming from DPW or the Recreation Board. And so there's inherently a bias towards recreation activities in open space rather than open space for the sake of green space. And what's recreation for people over 55? Yes. Space. That's that's a whole. <laughs> you know, and you look at the you, you look at the personal. city demographics. Um, only seventeen percent of the households in this city have kids. Um, and I raise kids here, and I loved raising kids here. But the growing demographic is is fifty five plus. Um, so I think that factors into the whole recreation and parks equation. If I can report back on my mission, yes. the finance department, uh, there is a Pierce Island Trust and it has eleven thousand four hundred fifty-eight dollars and thirteen cents. It needs a seven-person committee, yeah. <laughs> or maybe not. Okay. Um. So. I I think it's it's reasonable to have this bigger conversation at this stage just because if Pierce Island is going to sunset, even if there are people who've just joined and who had exciting um, exciting plans for Pierce Island committee, you know, maybe they would have those same plans being part of a, a bigger larger. committee or a different committee. Um, I, just, I just think the charge of a larger committee is much larger mm -hmm. than uh, you know. 
Yeah. It's a it's a much bigger commitment for people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And you know, aside from city staff acting on the master plan, what outreach do we have to find, acquire, and add more park space? Because every master plan we've had says we want green space. Well, here's one that pretty much nobody knows. There's a huge city park in the town of Madbury. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful park. Beautiful. Wonderful trails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's important to remember that we have a lot of, there's a lot of property that's owned by the city that's not developable, too. Um, that we could be talking about as park space, well, but maybe a different type of park space. That's the Jones Avenue, you know. We were going to put a middle school there till people got concerned that it was on top of a landfill, mm -hmm. for one thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the Great Bog, too, the Great Bog the great Park. Bog. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it does fit the city's definition of park. Yeah. Right. But if you had a, you know, I've seen lovely... Um, Boardwalks yeah. in spaces like that that are um, sensitive to conservation, uh, but provide a, an opportunity in a space like that for it to be. There are park foot space. trails all through the Great Park. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you if you had a parks committee, maybe you'd have a map of the Great Bog for people, you know, with trails that people could and people could access it. Right, especially since it's going to be it's right next to what will be the new rail trail, yeah, and skate park. It, it's that kind of the thing that I'm thinking about that it would be nice to have a committee talking about all of the the spaces mm -hmm. that are available. Um, so would they be space. also looking at trails then? Mm -hmm. You could have mountain bike trails. Mm -hmm. You could have walking trails. Right. You could have, um, mm -hmm. Boardwalks like they have out at um, the Nature Preserve at Pees. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I think you could have all kinds of park spaces yeah. within the city, and and you would have to create a close relationship then with the recreation board, as well. Yeah. Um, I think uh, you have to be careful about joining mountain bikes and walking trails. Mm -hmm. It, and and that is part of the challenge is yeah. having those discussions around what is a walking space, what is a hiking space, what is a mountain biking space. You know, we have those those issues throughout the state of New Hampshire mm -hmm. on even on things like rail trails. You know, do yeah. we have three wheelers and four wheelers <laughs> on rail trails? Well, some of them, yes. You know, um, does it make sense coming right through the middle of a city? It's another discussion, right? right? And that's a state, state-run, state-owned mm -hmm. facility. But I think they're different. They're not all the same. Some of them are mostly reserved for bikes and walking, and others are specifically open to snowmobiles mm -hmm. in the winter. <laughs> right. So. So, it looks like what we're going to propose is um, we'll let Pierce Island Committee sunset, move the money to the trust fund, or, well, to the Well, it's in the, it's in trust the trust fund. funds Well, now. the trustees of trust fund, uh, or maybe that's already there. Um, and begin to work on, you know, a, uh, if you will, parks and recreation committee. Which would be a new a new ordinance for parks. And you know, I mean, uh, yeah, it'd be helpful, perhaps, to have a five minute summary from the planning director of what the master plans have said about yeah. parks over the years and maybe hear from Todd Henley on mm -hmm. programming in the parks, recreational programming in the parks, um, 
or lack of it. Right. Yeah. And maybe from um, Peter Rice on uh, uh, maintenance of spaces and, and any planning that's being done at DPW around park spaces. Yeah. Yeah, I think by default, the DPW director is running the parks right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to get his perspective. Right. Although anytime I get involved in city issues concerning open space in the parks and stuff, Peter Britz is always the guy. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Well, interesting. That's, too. that's right. Okay. So maybe we'll talk to um, the planning director and environmental planning. Right. Um, there will be spaces within the city that may be designated parks but are designated as spaces that we don't want people in as well for conservation purposes right so that makes sense maybe where I can set up I can try to set that up set up a discussion mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to have that at our next meeting I can start that process sure okay is, is that one of our more important uh, Think, yeah, because they pending. Yeah. So I'm going to change Pierce Island here to yellow. And I'm going to say voted to sunset discussion around parks rack committee. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's get through these few others. Well, we have. Bob's attention here. Um, the Personnel Advisory Board is the next yeah. item, and um, I think Bob can speak to this. My understanding is it's in the charter. Yeah, so. it's in the charter, section 3.15, and uh, it's, it's, it's a half a page, but what it really comes down to is the Personnel Appeals Board was set up to be a place where employees uh, could, in effect, uh, grieve disciplinary actions against them. Uh, it has very, very largely been superseded by collective bargaining agreements. A number of uh, city employees now who are not in a, in a bargaining unit uh, is a, a couple of handfuls. And if you're in a bargaining unit, then uh, every bargaining unit by law has to have a grievance by an agreement by law has to have a grievance procedure in it, and that has taken over from the personnel appeals board but there are still some employees that are not in a union and if they were disciplined for example they would have resort to the personnel appeals board but I do not believe that in my time here there has ever been a resort to the personnel appeals board I do not recall a single you're calling it Personnel Appeals Board, and then it's listed as Personnel Advisory Board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's here it's called, in the chart, it's Appeals Board. Oh, really? Okay. So I'm going to change the name of it here. Mm -hmm. I think it was listed on the website as Advisory Board, but it should be Appeals then. And um, if, it's, if it's in the charter, is there any reason at all that we should even consider Changing or should we just leave it alone, according to legal you counsel? Know, the, the process would Changing be so much charter. more onerous yeah. than, you know, sunsetting the Pierce Island Committee, for example, that it's, you know, maybe best. And there are, as they say, at least a theoretical possibility that some city employer would want to resort to it. So, so then you set it up. Okay. So we'll call this as active. Yep, as needed, and we'll just active say. Active as needed. Yeah. Active. I, I do happen to know that just before I got here, so this is m more than 40 years ago, there was a public works director named yes. Gordon Hanchett, his name yes. was, who in fact did follow this process when the city manager tried to fire him. Okay. It's there. I, it's theoretical anyway. So I took it out of consideration completely on my list. Mm -hmm. so um, you changed it to? Yes, I just changed it to clear and clean it's there and um, I'm going to take it out of bold so that it doesn't need to have anything done and it's 
left as needed and I put charter legal it's in the charter and so um, since it's in the charter um, I think that when we finish this process um, we'll just make sure that anything that's listed anywhere on our websites um, I'll work with the city clerk on this that it's listed that it says so on the website this Richard is established city in charter. charter yes so that people are aware so that no one goes through this exercise again <laughs> in a few years and thinks we need to address this um, you know as a matter of fact for your uh, information as counselors uh, the charter amendment process if it's gonna it's if it's gonna happen uh, at the next election for example really needs to begin right about now yeah yeah very no later be, than August right yeah. it'll very soon it'll be too late to amend the charter this year right that's logical yeah um, the Portsmouth Housing Endowment Fund Board um, I didn't I think that that one is um, is defunct I still don't have a full answer on it the last appointments occurred in 2013 and 11 you have to be considered on that and I have it to be consolidated there or considered um, I don't I don't have clear guidance on this one yet um, I was Some going to work with Portsmouth yeah. Housing Authority to find out what the status is but they've been a bit busy as of late as we all know um, so I feel like now that they have mm -hmm. broken they've, they've uh, done their ribbon cutting on a new building I will gladly reach out and double check on this one before we completely sunset it so it's a Portsmouth Housing Endowment Fund Board yes so is that endowment fund handled by the trustees is it uh, I think there are two and uh, one of them I know was funded at the time that Mariners Village Mm -hmm. um, went to a chapter 11 bankruptcy and uh, the new owner developing it to Osprey Landing there was some money that came out of that somehow and of course that was the affordable housing really affordable housing so, so some money got put into some kind of a trust for the, at that time and that that is one of the sources of money we're talking about and the other one is Joe Sartell was involved in setting up something and and the, the one I just mentioned is city control mm -hmm. Joe Sartell set up one which is the New Hampshire um, charitable charm fund I, should yeah, I remember that and uh, and the and the board of commission that we're talking about just gives advice on how to spend money from that private trust that's not a city trust. okay uh, put together was that when he put crossroads house in the uh, Prescott the building on Prescott Park it might have been yeah, might have been. yeah. Hmm. I know I, I know how to find out I mean I, know I can yeah get the answer is that a significant amount of money or is it in the charitable it foundation a, it was a lot of, it was a lot of money I think yeah yeah he matched he matched uh, two to one on that, on that I think interesting okay so if there's no other concern I will double check this one the Portsmouth Housing Authority and see if it is indeed defunct. it does not have recent appointments is what I will say the most recent appointment was like 2013 uh, but we might not have the term data on that as well um, let's just take a have we got time to look at the ordinance itself um, Portsmouth Housing Endowment Sorry, it takes a second. Oh, yeah, Here yeah. we go. Ports, Portsmouth Housing Endowment Fund Advisory Board, um, seven voting members, a realtor maintaining an office in the city of Portsmouth who shall reside in Portsmouth, a residential real estate banker who's a resident of Portsmouth, a local appraiser who's a resident of Portsmouth, a city resident, Mark Brayton. Yep, <laughs> a representative of the Portsmouth Housing Corporation. An administrative official of the city from the Bureau of Community and Economic Development who shall be an ex officio member, an administrative of the, of the city from the legal department who shall be an ex officio member. All members shall be appointed by the mayor and the council with the exception of the city officials who shall be designated by the city manager. 
um, appointed to serve three-year terms um, without compensation powers, formulate general policies regarding the oper operation of the program, including application criteria, establishing specific policies as the need may arise dictated by the program demands, advise the city manager and city staff with regard to oper operation of the program, and the advisory group shall not have authority over the investment of the Portsmouth Housing Endowment Fund Trust, which functions, functions shall remain with the trustees of the trust funds. And the advisory group shall meet at least semi-annually and may be called by the city manager, the sta city staff representatives, or upon the request of the advisory board on five days' notice, which notice may be waived in an emergency. So there is some program that that was attached to. Yes. And there is money in the trust funds. There's money in the trust funds. And I'm just not sure if this still exists. It might be like that economic development um, grant that's gone now and so there's no reason for them to meet um, and that might be why we haven't seen appointments since 2013 now, I wonder if it's the housing affordable housing endowment that we talked about at the council which is small but it's like a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars or something um, I think it was I don't know yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then there's this intriguing fund at the Charitable Foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't know who administers that and how is that administered? I don't know. You know, that, and this is the, these are the questions that I have. Um, uh, the Housing Authority Director, Craig Welch, was on this committee, so he should know, he should know. the yeah. status of it. So that's what I, I was going to reach out to him. I just wanted to let them get through their major event last week. No, that would be great. Okay. Um, Andrew might know, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Andrew in finance. Yeah. In finance. Yeah. So I will reach out. That's kind of the final one that I have a question mark around because the Seacoast MPO Technical Advisory Committee um, is not one of our committees. And that's why I couldn't find information about it. It's Rockingham um, County. Yeah. It's a Rockingham County Planning Commission committee. It's not ours. Um, so we just have it listed because we have we've had a representative on in the past um, for this committee um, so that's that's why we we have it there so and it's usually a representative is my understanding from the staff not from not appointed from well it's both actually there's always a council um, representative to Rockham County to Rockham planning, planning, planning Commission yes and Rockham planning meets as the MPO and they review all the highway projects and set priorities and for example last time they said rail trail is our top priority mm -hmm. um, so it, it's all functioning okay so I'm gonna leave it here as is we remove this from our list because it's not our committee right so it's it shouldn't be on city. the city listing yeah. it'll be on Rockingham planning um, I don't know what color I'm going to make that, but it's... Yeah, and I think Councilor Moreau is the liaison, right, that was appointed by the mayor, so... Yes, so it's not orange, so it's not something that we need to consider again, but it's something that I need to take action on. So I'm going to make it green for now, um, just to make sure that we remove it, um, that we take that action. Um, so we only have one left that we need to find out about, the Housing Endowment Fund um, Board. Um, as far as sunsetting or and so that's and the all the committees in yellow are the ones that will sun, that we have talked about sunsetting so that's how there, there are a huge number here that that we can sunset at this stage oh I was going to give an update the Vaughn Mall Blue Ribbon Committee and um, the uh, Strategic worth, Planning Committee oh the worst Yes, uh, Worth, Worth um, Bridge. Bridge. They made all their recommendations already yeah. and finished their work. And all of that went to Department of Public Works. So the recommendation from right. staff was to go ahead and just sunset for those two as well. And that if we needed another committee, we would establish another committee at this stage. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's. Are we taking that off? Then? Yeah, so I put them staff for Meckerman's sunset and I made them yellow. So all the sunsetted committees are in yellow at this stage. 
Um, so renewable energy, blue ribbon committee. Yes, because that's now in inner energy. Well, renewable energy became sustainable practices, and then inner um, energy advisory as well. So. And renewable energy completed their report and actually had a policy that was passed by the council. So. Right. So. Um, so a lot of these these committees and organizations did great work when they were present, but they're just not doing that work anymore. So it's time what, to remove them. What about the building commission? Um, it doesn't exist anymore. That was the information we received from staff. Okay. Is that it's it's not relevant to the work that they're doing at this stage. So so I think that's it. So we have several ordinances. Um, that is part of our final review will be able to recommend to remove yeah. these ordinances mm -hmm. and we'll start working with legal on de developing a red line of the administrative code with ordinances that can can be removed at this stage right and then one you didn't have on there was the committee that I'm going to this afternoon is the yes. public access finance advisory committee okay and I'm going to add that because we don't have it on the list. No, I know. I, but I'm on it, so I know it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> it's helpful to know. Um, it's so. called Public Access Financial Advisory Committee. Okay, so Public <clears throat> Access Financial Advisory Committee. And it's by ordinance. Huh, how did I miss that then? It's, it, it's hard to find. Okay. It meets once a year. Okay. Okay. Oh, I know that one. Yeah. So we're that's appointed by the city council. With Andrew and yeah, that one. And it's a standing committee. Does it have any the public um, access? He's talking about is public access to telecommunications. It's the it's the public access channel on cable TV. Ah. Uh, so what what this committee BBM does? TV. Yeah. Well, but what this committee does is there's um, we get money from Comcast basically. Mm -hmm. And the only purpose of this committee is to designate the amount of money that we give from what we get to Comcast from Comcast to the uh, PPMT uh, PPMTV. TV. Like the okay. public access money that comes from Comcast goes into a trust. It doesn't go to directly to the public access channel. And uh, the committee that that Vince is talking about meets once a year and approves the budget for the public access channel people to okay. spend money from that trust. Okay. That's what that makes sense. Well, we now have it on the committee list. Okay. It would be helpful to make so that we make sure we have a listing. And of I can who give sits. you. I can. I can. Um, well, this no. I have. I have the ordinance for it. Um, well, one of the reasons why it might have been hard to find is I think it's set up by the trust. Oh. No, but I think you no. Angel gave me the ordinance from it, so I have that. I will. I will scan it and send it to you. Okay. Okay. You gave it to me. Yeah, I, yeah. I like them. Well, I'm almost certain I thought it was in the okay. trust. Well, this is helpful because it's nice to. I, I want to make sure right. we have a complete listing. I think it's in the trust. I, yeah. I remember writing it or being involved in writing it. It, it's helpful to have a complete listing available online so that everybody can see all the organ, all the committees, boards, commissions, blue room committees that we have. So that'll be helpful to yeah. have. And how it's established, what ordinance, so that people can look that information up. Um, so I'm going to also, is there, I'm gonna share now the appointed boards and commissions and terms list that I also have um, today. Um, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Let me try one you more send time. Send that to us too. No, I. We can no, it's that, just so. available on the website. So yeah, um, that's right. Yes, if I can find it. Yeah, I know some of these things are hard to find. Yeah, it's, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't want me to pull it up. So here, there. Got it. So here is the list of our current. This is what's available on the website. The list of Portsmouth City Council appointed boards and commissions and so what I did is I went through this boards and commissions and I was just going to give you guys a quick overview um, 
this is that next item, committee appointment rotation schedule. Um, I went through and looked at the dates of, of people's rotations on and off these um, boards. And so for example, um, the first committee that's listed, if I can get to the first page, doesn't want to get me to the first page, is the audit committee. Um, and the ordinance for this committee um, establishes an unusual rotation, um, but what will happen because of the way that the ordinance is, is written, um, three members shall be for three-year terms and two members for two-year terms. All members shall serve three years. Um, well, there are only three people appointed and then there are two city councilors appointed. Um, so in effect, all three individuals have, um, well, one has a two-year term, but then two have three-year terms, but you don't have what's envisioned here, and you essentially have everybody being appointed again um, in short order. You have two appointed two in short order. Um, so the, the rotation doesn't work if you have currently unless you had more members um, because you're going to have a year that you don't have anyone appointed um, which is supposed to be a five member term I think the assumption was that you would have city council reps filling in there but currently with that you have three people leaving around the same time and two at another time and when you have three year terms yeah. before we go take a deep dive into the rotation is this committee something that is really appropriate um <laughs> yeah i gotta go i think this is a valid question well and uh, i mean it seems to me that this is a city council responsibility. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and it is a staff responsibility to do the work of it, mm -hmm. to submit, uh, create and submit, um, put out requests for proposals, it's, um, to take all that, do that type of work. Mm -hmm. I guess. I would sunset it myself. Can I can I say something here? I, uh, yes. I, I think Vincent's correct on everything he said, and I and I don't know what your purview is, you know, in terms of the considerations you should be taking into account. That is a, would be a hugely political decision, and the you know people would come in with guns blazing mm -hmm. if you try to do that, and I just you know so you. Not something for you to think about. It's a, if it wasn't for the gun blazing thing, I'd be in total agreement. Get rid of that. I'll take this minute. Um, yeah. Is this something that, um, so that we can get through this list and talk about all the different terms and challenges around it, is this something that you would be willing to bring back to the committee for the next committee session for discussion? Sure. If we're going to talk about parks that maybe we can also, okay. I will add it to the list then um, for our next committee meeting and we can have a more robust discussion around that. Yeah. Um, well, that'll be a public comment session you wouldn't want to miss. <laughs> it's going to be raw on me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that said, so what I was trying to point out is the stagger doesn't work very well. I wasn't well. sure I wanted to run, run for re-election anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I would say about the stagger is I know Suzanne Woodland wrote that language. Yes. So we ought to give her a chance to Right. right. Yeah, I think and the intent was there was an existing committee with an existing person, mm -hmm. so he would slide in for uh, two years and then the others would be appointed for three years right so it would all line up so it would all line up that was the intention right exactly. now maybe it, it didn't quite work that way right sometimes it just doesn't work and i think that that's what we're going to see in a lot of these committees 
when we're going through them. Um, so when, like, you look at the building code um, board of appeals, which is the next one, I'm going to enlarge this a little even more. Uh, five members, two alternates, they have five-year terms. Well, the challenge, if you look at the terms here, I'm kind of trying to highlight, is that if you have five members and they have five-year terms, you should appoint one each year, essentially, if you want a healthy rotation, right? But unfortunately, we have two members in 2023, two members in 2022, so we don't have a healthy rotation. And we have a, someone listed here as a committee member whose term was supposed to expire in 2018. So it's really unclear um, what that what the staggers. Is this is the Building Code Board of Appeals, oh. and uh, the 2018 rotation out was one of the alternates. So I don't know if that alternate is still serving or not. Um, and it's the same with uh, uh, another member is listed as um, expiring in in 2020. So it's not really clear to me that the rotation is accurate. And even if it were, we shouldn't have two members of a five-member committee that have five-year terms both rotating off at the same time. It should be one each year. They meet very infrequently, but they do meet. Right. So, so this is one of those where we need to rework. Um, the next one down, I'll tell you which one this is, is um, the Cable Television and Communications Commission. Um, and uh, there are, this is, difficult because there's supposed to be five members and one alternate three-year terms for reappointments and two-year terms for initial appointments but really um, from, from what I can tell is we only have two members we have one that left in 2019 so we don't even have five members we have several vacancies here so even if they met this committee they don't have a quorum they don't have a quorum right so we have to have a discussion around so how do you we need to be talking about how do you we need to be staffing those the next one is the cemetery committee this one is fine and the reason it's fine is because it's ordinance says the terms coincide with the council term mm -hmm. so they just get reappointed every two years yeah so that one's fine plus it be simple yes that one's very simple right um, so then you go to um, the Citizens Advisory Committee here. Um, I think these individuals still serve, but unfortunately, um, let me see if I can scroll over. Um, we don't we don't know that they still serve because we don't have interims. So, so this is one of those I need to talk to the city clerk and see if these people are still serving, and who's serving, and what their terms are, and if they're staggered correctly. Um, the citywide neighborhood um, blue ribbon committee, which I think is not really a blue ribbon. Well, it is a blue ribbon committee still. Um, it's not by ordinance. But it's yeah. So. But it's got precedent of what twelve, fourteen years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Goes back to Evelyn. Oh, Evelyn Sorrell. So it's probably so. twenty something years. So um, some of these that have been blue ribbon committees for a long time, we have to ask ourselves, do we establish them by ordinance because we want them to be around? Um, or do they just serve their purpose as blue ribbon committee? Because we have um, committees like the cemetery committee that are appointed to serve the same terms as the council, that is not an unreasonable thing to do. And so this one's fine. They're reappointed to the end of the council term. Uh, Conservation Commission, um, is way off on terms. So um, they should have seven members, two alternates. They should have three-year terms. Okay. So by my calculation, then, um, you should have three, three, and three rotating off in, in um, 2023, 2024, and 20, um, 20, Five. 25. But what we have is we have six rotating off in 2023 two in 2024 and we still have one listed as 2022 as an alternate so who might not have reapplied so so that stagger is way off for the conservation commission um the economic development commission um let's go a little far it's hard when i'm scrolled in this far doesn't like to hey come on little page it's one there 
there. So for the Economic Development Commission, which is at the bottom of this page, we'll see if I can do it this way. There, you can see the terms. Nine members, four-year terms. Uh, for 2022, we have three members rotating off. 2023, none. 2024, two. And 2025, five rotating off. Okay? The problem with that is that you should have, if you have um, four-year terms and you have several individuals that serve on this committee as um, they serve as appointees that have their own time frame term, um, like uh, the mayor serves, uh, two city councilors serve as well, um, our economic development director, the city manager, they don't have terms. But then of the nine, you would think that you'd have um, three, three, and, or two, 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 you know, four. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we just don't have a healthy rotation there either. Um, and, and so this is what I'm finding when I'm going through most of these, so you know. Um, the ethics boards is fine. The fee schedule study committee is fine, although these should be 2023. The historic district commission is off as well. Um, we have uh, seven members, two alternates for three-year terms, uh, which would mean we'd need a rotation of two, two, and three. And in that three, you have an alternate, right? Um, two, three-year terms? Um, three-year terms for the Historic District Commission. They, they, they always have had two-year terms, but I think because the mayor um, put new people in as voting members, that's what happened. Oh, interesting. So, so that's what up, it's listed. Huh. So that corrupted that. Yeah, so this is, so we have five people rotating off. Essentially, some of those have been reappointed already for their next three-year term in 2022, one in 2023, two in 2024. So that staggers way off as well. Um, housing Authority has got it right on track. So this is what I wanted to see when I'm seeing one. For the Housing Authority, we had five members, five-year terms. There's one in each year from 2023 to 2027. So that's what we should see when it's appointed accurately. Um, the library trustees um, are short a member and also um, the tr library trustees are generally um, off just a little. Two in 22, 22, four in 2023, two in 2024. Um, so then we get to um, parking traffic safety. Um, this one is, is really skewed as well. They get three year terms. We have none reappointed in 2022. One in 2023, and that's an alternate position, and four in 2024 which means you're gonna turn over the whole board at the same time. Right. Um, Pierce Island is sunsetting. Um, let me see if I can get to page four. Um, the next one that I think is a concern is on page five, like the next to last page. Um, the planning board also has challenges. There are no appointments in 2022. There are three in 2023 and five in 2024. And these are nine members, three year terms, plus two alternates. I think the same thing happened there, is that the mayor uh, appointed mm -hmm. instead of... Um, An alternate, a full member. Yeah. And and so this is the challenge though, is, is how we fix this. The recreation board is on track. Um, 10 members, three year terms. We have three in 2023, two in 2024, two in 2025. Um, so that's where we should be, and three have been reappointed. Um, the Sustainable Practices Blue Ribbon Committee, that's, um, this is a real challenge. This committee, I think the way that they're appointed, because it's a Blue Ribbon Committee, technically I would think everybody gets reappointed every two years. But we have people who have been appointed to this committee since 2006 and never been reappointed. Once people are appointed to this committee, they never. they're just there forever. 
um, there's not a until they just choose not to be there. So that's really unclear to me um, how that was established and why we don't have any rotation at all on that committee. Well, I think your instinct is correct. It, you know, they they that committee ends every two years. It's right. Re revitalized and reappointed. Right. Reappointed. Any blue ribbon committee, I think, should be in that situation. Um, that that's my understanding. The that's mayor appoints correct. blue ribbon committees. Um, trees in public greenery, again, one in 2022, none in 2023, five in 2024. Um, we essentially had lots and lots of appointments that occurred from what I'm seeing in 2021. Um, and so then we ended up with people, um, for whatever reason, leaving probably, and then they had to be replaced. But unfortunately, they weren't replacing they didn't put people in to fill the remainder of a term. They just appointed them for a full term. Um, the trustees of the trust fund rotates appropriately. Um, here, 2023, 2024, 2025. Um, but then you get to um, the zoning board. Oh, and I'm not clear on the veterans organization. Uh, uh, the appointment, I don't know if uh, Bob Lister's appointment here if when that gets renewed or how that gets renewed and what kind of rotation or if it's just established. Um, the zoning board um, also has some challenges as well. There are two appointments in 2022, none in 2023, two in 2024, one in 2025, and two in 2026. So um, I'm not sure what kind of adjustment needs to take place there, but that's another discussion as well. You're talking about the planning board. Uh, this is the zoning board of adjustment. Oh, ZBA. ZBA. Yeah. So, so essentially by going through this and looking at all these staggered terms, um, what I wanted to highlight is how far off so many of our committees are um, in having appropriate stagger in terms. And um, I wanted to make a recommendation, which is going to require a lot of work but I wanted to get some feedback here because we need to discuss the best way to handle this these term challenges um, I thought that it would be appropriate for all the established commissions boards and committees that are established by ordinance um, to go back and look at when they were established and what the terms were when they were initially established and then follow those terms out and who was appointed to replace who and we're anywhere in that term list where we find somebody um, resigning early from their term and somebody coming in to replace we should flag that and say okay how many years were left in that term that that new person should have actually stepped into the role and fulfilled the term rather than fulfilling um, that rather than serving an additional whatever number of years three five years whatever the committee was and kind of follow that track out and readjust the terms based upon what they should be for those filling. So we might have in some committees, for example, somebody that was appointed in the 1980s to, fuf to fulfill the end of a term but got a full term instead of fulfilling the end of somebody else's term, which means we would need to take a, a year and a half off of a term of a current person serving in that, in that same position. And instead of having people appointed for terms, we have positions appointed. So you have nine members, each each position on that board, one through nine, has a term, three years, if it's a three-year term. Yeah, and whoever's in that term fills that term. So somebody might even get appointed to serve two months to fill out the end of a term, but they're filling terms. It's not individuals that have a three-year term, it's the position that has a term. Yeah. So they'd have to political. Go ahead. Yeah, that would be <laughs> hot one there. I think. Right. But this is I'm trying to create a way that we do go back and do the research. It might mean that our current mayor has fewer appointments in the end because some of some of those rotations there are some that are really beneficial right now to him that he's going to get a lot of appointments. Um I think the HDC was one of them, right? But um, and his appointees are going to serve longer currently. But by doing, um, by readjusting this, we can get back on that schedule. And no one, we wouldn't know, we have no idea who would benefit right now. 
from those appointments is the way that I'm looking at it, from those shifts, because it may be back 20 years where we find that this dagger's off. So there's a part A and a part B. Part A is the lookup, mm -hmm. and part B is the policy change mm -hmm. that these are terms, not individuals. So if somebody's appointed to fill two months of a remaining term, they'd have to be reappointed. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. My sense, that's, that's more the spirit of the ordinance in general is that you have, so that you have, ro that rotation is part of the spirit of the ordinance um, in, in all of these cases, for all of these committees. And then by not having a healthy rotation, you lose expertise at the wrong time. You don't build up expertise. When you reappoint a board and you have to reappoint everybody on it, um, except for one person, that person has, their expertise has to carry the whole board for a significant period of time. The, the land use boards, though, are, those are by state statute, right? They are, they are. So is the state statute silent on that? Or? The state statute is fairly silent on. Uh, because what happens is they didn't, well, again, they ignored filling positions that are vacated. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. And the state statute does say something, I don't remember which one, and. Uh, our, our legal counsel can correct me here if I'm wrong, but says that somebody would fulfill the remainder of a term and they could be reappointed. Um, or maybe that's in our ordinance itself, that it says somebody fills the remainder of a term, but I think somewhere we got off there mm -hmm. on a few of those. Um, yeah, I can't do it from memory. I don't know. Yeah. But we would have the authority as a city, as a municipality, to have our own interpretation of the state statute to say these are terms, not people, mm -hmm. and, you know, interim appointments to fill out a vacancy you have know, to be reappointed. Yeah, they, I know the planning board is quite specific. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you, get, you have to comply with what mm -hmm. the state statute says. Mm -hmm. I think, and What's interesting is when I was going back and reading it, and I'm not a, an attorney, and I'm definitely not a municipal attorney, <laughs> um, it, the intention was pretty clear that the, the goal was to establish a healthy rotation yeah. of members. Mm -hmm. And once you get to a point where you're not, you don't have a healthy rotation of members, I don't think that you're, you're necessarily um, in the spirit of the RSA anymore. Yeah, there's a limit to the number of appointees the mayor can do per year. There's quite a bit of controversy at the moment on the planning board in which uh, the, the chair and the staff and the legal department and outside council even have little disagreements on what the appointment process could be and who's eligible and that's sort of ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, it will get resolved I think at the planning board level itself in the pretty foreseeable future because it's coming that way. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is stay tuned on the planning board. Mm -hmm. gonna happen. Right. I would like to have a policy that we just approach all of our boards and all of our commissions in the same way. And we look at all of them and we use the same method for looking at everyone so that there is, that it's clear that there is no bias um, and that we're taking approach, an approach that um, is historical that we're looking at the historical appointments and trying to track back which position was appointed when and to make sure that um, we, we establish a healthy rotation without um, having any preferential treatment to anybody's appointees in particular. Um, I think that, that's my goal, is to find, have a very fair process that um, follows where we should have been at this point. Um, it's it would require a lot of research. Yeah, I was so it would be say, really clear. I, and, you know, I, don't, I guess I'm trying to figure out the best process to correct this problem. I don't know what it is. I mean, maybe that that's one approach to it, but I don't. I'd have to really think about. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice if we could just come up with some blanket way by taking one vote, for example. 
that the city council could create the proper kind of staggering that you know think about that there might be some you know like it's kind of a vision in my head that there'd be a way to say in making all appointments to all boards you know something that follows that that means there's automatically going to be the right kind of stagger my concern is I don't want anyone who's currently serving and sitting um, to feel like they were arbitrarily chosen to have their the length of their term shortened um, you know uh, I want to make sure everybody understands that that's because you know six years ago when we appointed to this board we appointed to some, somebody to fill the remainder of a term but they served longer and so we have to readjust your position backwards that doesn't mean you can't be reappointed again you know right. you can be reappointed again it's just a matter of making sure that you're appointed to the correct term for your position on that board well and we also want whatever this universal policy is to deal with like the blue ribbon sustainability committee where you're appointed but your term expires and you just keep going um, so I mean the spirit of the policy that we're looking at is that um, appointments are staggered so that there is um, institutional knowledge pr preserved mm -hmm. and is the best way to achieve that to say we're appointing terms not people I mean there's a lot there's some sound logic to that I, I certainly like the idea that somebody who's appointed to fill out a vacancy gets reappointed mm -hmm. um, rather than serve some weird length of time that's out of out of sync with the rest of the board is that and is that what's happening now I don't I think currently what we're doing is we're appointing people to serve a full time when they replace somebody even if somebody left early yeah and, um, that's, that's what's happened yes and it's happened across the board in every one of our every one of our committees so that we're not ending up with a stagger in terms and in some of them it's pretty egregious at this point um, because for whatever reason several individuals left at the same time mm -hmm. um, uh, it it's a real challenge then because you also are in a situation with um, say our current mayor had the opportunity to appoint reappoint almost an entire board um, which it looks to me like that is almost the case with the HDC at this point um, then the next mayor assuming it's a different mayor maybe it's the current mayor again um, would not have any opportunity to appoint anyone to that board um, and so there'd be a question around it you know say the next mayor had a particular interest in historic districts and what was going on in historic districts and wouldn't have any opportunity to appoint two members to that um, so so then you have um, you don't necessarily get the benefit of the expertise um, of that mayor necessarily making those appointments and I think that over time the challenge around that is that it's helpful to have different eyes on the people at serving on these committees and having um, different mayors appointing them over time because everyone has a different perspective and knows different people within the community um, so that is one of the disadvantages um, there's less diversity in committees in this sense um, and you have a tendency to have only one viewpoint represented when one person appoints the majority on that committee and then you end up with um, you don't have a healthy discussion mm -hmm. um, on issues which I think is not good for anybody in the city we should not always agree <laughs> yeah and I think some of the boards um, had vacancies that appeared between the last year's election and the and the new 
council coming in, mm -hmm. and as a result, you know, those vacancies were filled with um, alacrity, and um, and that's one reason we have so so many openings. What three years from now? You know, we should. It's been a recommendation to us to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, should. Um, should those appointments wait for the new mayor and council? Mm -hmm. Well, here's a problem that's happened in the recent. Past. We know what you're talking about is not hypothetical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's happened in our recent memory, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the problems that uh, that I've seen is this. Some of these boards and commissions, here's two, the planning board and the zoning board, are by and large make quasi-judicial decisions. Mm -hmm. They are supposed to be neutral. Mm -hmm. And when a person gets appointed to one of those boards because, let's say, they're anti-development, mm -hmm. then that that is not an appointment that actually meets the purpose for which that board exists. It's the opposite. It's like appointing somebody to be a judge because they think everybody who gets arrested is guilty. Mm -hmm. It's just not, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if maybe the answer is specify in the ordinance what the appointment criteria should be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that this is a quasi-judicial position. Right. Appointment should be a person who has demonstrated um, uh, neutrality and you know ability to make impartiality. It, yeah. Because that, you know, I mean, that's the problem we've seen. I don't think it's unreasonable to look at the ordinance as well and consider adding language around that. But at least on the ones that are quasi judicial, and then some of them, of course, are not. Some of them you can have uh, unknown predisposition, and that's fine. You might even get appointed for that reason, but not on a quasi judicial board. Um, the the only challenge is that um, there is no recourse if somebody doesn't serve um, in a uh, non-prejudicial um, stance for removal yeah, the only, in the RSA. Right, There's right, no... Right. On, on most of those boards, uh, the city council can remove board members for cause, and these, but you have to cause. You can't just... Right. No, in a, in a, in a yeah. really egregious case of somebody demonstrating a bias on a on a quasi judicial board, that would be cause, I'm, in my opinion, and mm -hmm. I certainly be willing to carry that ball pretty far. So, you know, things. But that's a challenge. You know, that wouldn't prevent. You know, that wouldn't fix the rotation necessarily. Yeah, it wouldn't fix the rotation. And um, wouldn't preserve expertise, which I think is one of the, the great values of people serving for uh, more than a few years on one of these boards is they they share their knowledge and, and expertise and over time um, that really benefits the city. I think that's why when, and when we reviewed the rules, we changed the rules so that there was no special review if somebody had served more than 10 years um, because we appreciate their expertise. Um, so, um, so I think we've already even discussed that. Um, so this is something that we need to think about. Like, how are we going to um, how are we going to do this? One of the things that I'm happy to do is to sit down with the city clerk and see if what I'm suggesting is even feasible. Um, like, I'll pick out one of these. Right. Let's just do a feasibility test. Yes. Yeah. You know, really. And see if this is even a feasible process because some of these boards and commissions go back. Long ways. Long time. Yes. So determining who rotated off and who filled what role will be a long process, I think. And it might be we cut it off at a certain year. I don't know if it doesn't. If we get to a good healthy rotation, I don't know. Um, but I'm happy to at least do a test mm -hmm. and and see because maybe what I'm suggesting is not feasible, and I'm not sure if that's the case or not. Um, uh, but. It'll be helpful to have that discussion. I don't know that you'd have to go back to the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it may be you, but that we you'd have to discover that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think it's. It, I, I certainly support the the feasibility test because I think let's find out if we can get that information because I think anything a lot of data crunching. Yeah, yeah. but anything follow, we trying to follow through. The, but it could really inform the question of do we want to appoint terms or people? Mm -hmm. You know, so however, whatever amount of data we need to inform that and no more okay. um, would be my sense. Um, if you want me to also, I can invite the city clerk to also come potentially to our next discussion of terms yeah. because um, she would be the expert on on all these terms and advertising them and the long-term appointments. Okay. It's getting kind of late. Um, do we want to discuss this further? Or do we want to continue this discussion at our next meeting? Do that? I'd say continue. Um, and if you could send us your worksheet with the rollovers. Yes. I think that'd be good for us to study. Okay. I can do that. I have them I have notes written in hand handwritten notes. But um well, or send it to us as a spreadsheet. I'll 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 copy this or over header. with my individual notes. I'll add notes to send you um, so that you have them. And I'll send the spreadsheet that also has the information on committees so that you guys have an updated spreadsheet. I um, I kind of updated my spreadsheet. Um, as we were talking about it, but ah, good. Uh, but I, 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 I would let you send send yours because I want to make sure it's right. Okay, I will do that. Um, do we have any public comment? I don't see anybody. No, no one signed. No one's me. public. Okay. Um, so. Under, do we have any other business? Um, two items. Uh, I'm on vacation the date of our next meeting. Okay. So if we could meet Tuesday, I'd be back. Let's see. Or I could just miss that one. But Let's look at the. It's the um, 27th, I believe. Okay. Um, I can do the 28th. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Works for me. Um, Does that work for you? I have to check something. Okay. I'll let you check. Check. Um. And I will go through all your checking. What I have on the agenda for the next meeting is a re report back on the housing endowment, that last committee that we're mm -hmm. not sure on, um, a audit committee discussion, mm -hmm. um, park committee discussion, mm -hmm. and a feasibility on rotation. Okay. And um, and I have noted Councillor Tabor's interest in discussing um, time frame as well for appointments, um, specifically following election cycles. Um, right. And uh, so we should really be looking at appointments in November and December, and which boards rotate then and make it. A decision around when those. Yeah, I think. Or if we change that. Councillor Denton, if I'm not mistaken, has spoken to. Shouldn't they all just happen January one with the new term, or, or after the swear? Right after the election. Yeah. Right after the election. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yes. So the next meeting that you're proposing is Thursday, July 28th at 10? Uh, no, June 28th. June. June 28th. June 28th. Unfortunately, um, we're, we meet every two weeks. <laughs> we do that just so that we keep um, legal, the legal department um, busy. Yeah. So, so, so Mary, she just gets on Suzanne's calendar and mine so that we're sure somebody's here. Um, would you like me to run down to the clerk to see if Suzanne's available? You know, if it's not available, we will find another space to meet in. Um, I know that there's another conference room that I'll try to reserve if that's okay. the case. Um, and worst case scenario is that if we can't have this room or the room next door um, or a conference room upstairs, um, then I will try to reschedule. Um, but I want to find out if Council Lombardi yeah, can do that I, first. Um, or I could just be absent on the 27th. I hate to have yeah. one of three yeah. members. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm on planes, so I can't attend by Zoom. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying the 28th at 10? The 28th at 10. All right. I think I can do that. Okay. All right. So we will plan on the 28th at 10. Um, the next meeting follow, following that one currently would be the 11th, but that is also a city council day. Um, I don't know how you feel about having a meeting on the city council day. We can always push that to the 18th if that's preferential in July I, I'm going to be away on the 18th okay no I, I don't mind it on City Council day do you mind it on I tend to prefer not to but it's July I don't think we're as busy as budget time and yeah um, okay as long as I have the weekend <laughs> before <laughs> okay so that I will leave it then for um, the 11th um, in, at 10 o'clock in the morning um, and uh, and what follows on that is a meeting on the 25th, um, which there is not a there is not a scheduled meeting that day. Um, I wanted to give the committee one final heads up before we leave that I am away for three Mondays in August. So um, when we hit August, the only days I am available are August the first and August the 29th on Mondays. Um, I do have some time on a few Tuesdays, the 2nd, 23rd, um, 30th, so. Um, and since we're such a small committee, I try to always make sure we're all available um, so that we can all attend, so. Well, I probably, um, I'll be back and forth to, but I'll, your away dates kind of match mine so okay yes yes I'm away the uh, for quite two and a half weeks so mm -hmm. um, yeah in August I have something scheduled and I just check okay so when we get to August we'll try to we'll try to fit in a meeting somewhere in August um, but it's gonna be a challenge to get in more than one meeting I think right. at this point so um, and with that, um, oh, I had one. Uh, one more. My okay. second item was, uh, I was thinking about from our discussion about parks, and we have a lot of easements to the water hmm. around the city, um, and it seems appropriate for us in a governance committee to ask how we monitor those and keep those enforced. We've had a couple come up in the last term. Um, I don't know that we even want to answer that today, but. Uh, well, let me give you the quick overview. There are some actually dedicated easements to the water, and, then, and, and they're also, we've acquired some property on the water. And then the third thing is, there are places where the city has a paramount claim to other people, mm. but it's not necessarily written. And that, uh, the best example of that last situation would be uh, Paper Street running to the water. Yep. Very, very common. I think there's 14 in the city. And uh, the, the 
the way they are monitored is uh, very informally. There's no, no, nobody goes and checks them specifically. It's, it's, it's a complaint system. Uh, if somebody complains, uh, complains that you know people are using an area they shouldn't, or people are not being allowed to use the area they should, that kind of thing. Um, we send somebody out to check on them. It most generally would be Peter Britz again, although Jason Page has gone as well on these situations. But uh, I suppose the main thing is totally informal. Now, uh, the mayor at one point was interested in putting together a list of yes. uh, these things, mm -hmm. uh, and I, and it didn't happen. I don't believe the list exists. Yeah, I think we talked about it at yeah. the last council. Yeah, that's what, that's what it was. The, the mayor, when he was a mayor, the last council talked about it, but then the council term ended without it ever happening. Okay. Hmm. Well, I mention it because the city attorney has one of his quiet accomplishments over the years has been to expand the city's access to the water, citizens' mm -hmm. access mm -hmm. to the water. And I just want to make sure we protect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually a lot of public access to the water in the city, mm. but a lot of it's unknown, a little known. This might be um, something, a, a good subject for uh, an ordinance around easements and access yeah just so we can solidify that in right. rules at the council level right whether a pay, if it's, if something shows on a tax map as a street going to the water then that that's a, the definition of a paper street um, sometimes the title issues and the actual legal interest involved in a paper street can be determining a, uh, in a paper street can be really complicated Involving historical and real estate title and all kinds of stuff, but the position that we take to have in order to have a uniform position on everything is, if the tax map shows a paper street going to the water, then our initial starting point is always that means that the city owns to the water, and any citizen that wants to can walk there, and we have to be backed off of that position by legal argument, okay. or else we don't back off it. So. Okay. Right. Hmm. Food for thought. All right. Thank you. Yes. Um, is there any other business? No. All right. No. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 You're adjourned. <laughs>